Welcome to this uh, reality check. As usual with this uh, event series, Security Law, a reality check, we look at uh, pressing uh, international challenges and the role of international law and, of course, also broader international institutions for uh, addressing them. Exactly one year ago, we reflected on the impact of the Trump administration's policies on international law. Today, a year later, we take stock of our current turbulent times. And we want to look at what's going on regarding the current international order. Indeed, if we look at recent editions of foreign affairs, for instance, we see that the state of the international order is up for debate. One issue letting go, Trump, America, and the world. Another one, which world are we living in? Are we talking of tribalism, liberalism, realism? Or one of the later ones, who will run the world? America, China, and the global order. So this is just one outlet, of course. But I do think that this reflects well the pressing challenges of today, and it reflects reflections that we should take seriously. We are in Geneva, a major hub of international institutions and law, global governance, liberal institutionalism, or more simply put, international cooperation. Therefore, today we will discuss what it means when the major player of the world system and one of the chief, defi chief designers, if not the chief designer, of international institutions turns its back on them. Will the current international institutions-based order hold? Or is it time to say goodbye? But then, what is the future going to look like? Now, we have the best and the brightest to reflect on these questions and lead our discussions. Mr. John B. Bellinger, three. John Bellinger is a partner at Arnold and Porter in Washington, D.C. and co hats the firm's global law and policy practice. He is also sen a junk senior fellow in international and national security law at the prestigious Council of Foreign Relations. He is a member of the U.S. Secretary of State's Advisory Committee on International Law, one of the four U.S. members of the Permanent Court of Arbitration in The Hague, member of the Council on Foreign Relations, the Executive Council on the American Law Institute, and member of the boards of the Stimson Center, the Salzburg Global Center, the American Ditchy Foundation, and Foreign Affairs Magazine. Mr. John B. Bellinger III has served as the legal advisor for the U.S. Department of State, and the legal advisor to the National Security Council at the White House. He has tremendous experience with international courts, <coughs> negotiating agreements, and also bridging divergent political and legal views on hot topics, such as the fight against terrorism and the use of military force. We are very grateful that Mr. Bellinger has taken time to join us and share his reflections with us today. Mr. Bellinger, thank you so much. The floor is yours. Thank you, Tobias. Nice to be here at the GCSP. Uh, the, this is actually my first time in the building here, so uh, interesting for me to see uh, all that has been done here with the center and indeed with the whole complex. Um, nice to be back in Geneva when I was legal advisor, which was the period from 2005 to 2009 in the Bush administration. I spent a lot of time in Geneva. Uh, probably as much time in Geneva as in The Hague since uh, much of international law has developed here. I headed the U.S. delegation for uh, a number of treaty negotiations, uh, including the third additional protocol to the Geneva Conventions. That's the one that created the uh, Red Crystal. Uh, I spent a lot of time with the ICRC uh, uh, talking about conflicts with uh, non-state actors. Uh, I appeared before the uh, treaty monitoring bodies on a number of occasions. And I was looking back, uh, I think my uh, last big event here was one, uh, to see how many of you all were involved in this, was down at the other end of the lake when I headed the US delegation that created the Mantra document, which were created some guidelines for uh, private security contractors, something that the Swiss and the ICRC had proposed to me because of the incredible power and influence of organizations like Blackwater, which were really sort of small military organizations, but for which there were no rules and 
uh, the Swiss and the ICRC assured me that we could actually run this process without it going off the rails, and, and, it, and it went pretty well. The mantra doctrine has now become the standard for private security contractors. Uh, I've now been out of office for uh, 10 years. I spent most of my uh, career going back and forth. Tobias and I were talking about this back and forth. I've been at our Justice Department. I've been at the State Department. I spent four years at the White House. I spent early in my career during the Cold War, I was assistant to the CI director, and then in between I've been in uh, private law firms, and I've now been back uh, uh, for probably the longest stint that I've had doing anything back heading the uh, international law practice at a firm called Arnold and Porter, where actually, interestingly, my, for, for those of you who are diplomats, uh, Tom Shannon, who was our undersecretary of state for political affairs, uh, including uh, the, for the first two years of the Trump administration, but was the most senior career diplomat in the State Department has come, just come and joined me, and that's why we've created this global law and policy practice. So uh, this is not a time now for me uh, to serve in government. Uh, the, to be clear, some of you know this, uh, I had uh, led the efforts of former Republican national security officials uh, who were opposed to uh, then-candidate Trump. We said in the uh, fall or uh, summer of 2016 that we thought he was not qualified to be president, that he lacked the judgment experience and values to be president. And in fact, if you look back at our letter, we said that uh, he would be uh, a danger to our national security and if elected, uh, would be the most reckless president in American history. Uh, I will let you be the judge of that. Uh, but uh, uh, for those many of you here, I know, uh, spend time back and forth in Washington, so you know this, but you know, what really has been interesting is how few former uh, Republican national security officials have served in this administration. And it's a, it's a dilemma for us every day because you know, we do have this ability in the United States to go back and forth between government uh, and the private sector. And so normally in a Republican administration, you know, people would be back in again staffing the State Department and the Defense Department. Uh, but about 95%, maybe even more than that, of people who were senior officials in uh, the Bush administration have refused to serve in this government, which has made it hard for them uh, to staff it, uh, which immediately raises the dilemma of, well, you know, what is the best form of public service? Should one go in to staff the government because they need good people, or does one better uh, help and serve the country and the government uh, from the outside. Uh, the State Department, where I most recently served as the uh, legal advisor, uh, uh, is, is got very few political appointees. There are only uh, uh, two of six undersecretaries, uh, only two of six geographic assistant secretaries. Again, many of you follow this very closely. Uh, one of the few confirmed assistant secretaries had been Wes Mitchell, the assistant secretary for European affairs, who was quite good. Uh, he lasted two years and resigned. Uh, uh, I wouldn't want to speak for him, but I think you know, widely reported that the, uh, that the president's uh, uh, statements about Russia uh, and his attacks on NATO and the EU were just too much for him to take as assistant secretary. So but it's been difficult to, uh, to staff the State Department. I'm here, uh, as you know, today uh, to speak to the NATO Legal Conference uh, tomorrow, and uh, tomorrow I'm going to reflect uh, a bit more narrowly on uh, the evolving uh, international uh, views on use of force, particularly with respect to counterterrorism um, and then humanitarian intervention. Uh, today I thought I would pull the aperture back just a little bit more and look a little bit more broadly uh, at uh, a broader set of subjects, both looking backwards and then looking forwards, and then have a discussion with you. It obviously is a, a very difficult, intense time uh, between uh, Europe uh, and the United States. President Trump is not easy to get along with, and he seems to pick fights with uh, our closest allies, uh, <coughs> Canadians, Australians, Brits, here in Europe. It's hard, hard for us to believe. Um, that said, uh, for those of you who are long-standing observers of the United States, we do have these ups and downs. Uh, the administration that I served in, the Bush administration, was uh, unpopular for a good chunk of its term. There were tensions. And then 
back in the Reagan administration, who uh, Ronald Reagan is now fondly remembered by many people, but uh, during that time uh, was unpopular in Europe over uh, the deployment uh, of the uh, INF, uh, INF missiles in Europe. So uh, we, it, it, this may well be the worst that I've seen, but we do have these ups and downs. So what I wanted to do for the first part here was to uh, review uh, the time during the Bush administration, how I tried to bridge some of these differences on international law. When I, I spent the first four years of the Bush administration as legal advisor to the National Security Council, I was in the Situation Room on 9-11. Uh, I had not come into the administration thinking I was going to spend time on counterterrorism issues and the Geneva Conventions and so forth, but that was where I ended up. Uh, of course, in the first term, we had uh, the Iraq War uh, and all of its unpopularity uh, and then uh, tensions over U.S. counterterrorism policies. Uh, I then ran Secretary Condoleezza Rice's transition, or Senate confirmation, moved over with her to the State Department, uh, and then was myself confirmed as the legal advisor. Uh, and I set uh, a set of goals for myself, for the State Department, and for the U.S. government in that second term of things that I wanted us to try to fix up from the first term, uh, and that was in the, in the area of international law. So I wanted to talk about a couple of those. Um, we had tensions, of course, over the Iraq War, counterterrorism policies, international criminal court, and then the Bush administration's overall approach to uh, international law and international institutions, sort of, the, sort of the suggestion that the Bush administration didn't believe in international law at all. So I really set out you know, when I became legal advisor in 2005 to try to uh, bridge those differences through uh, both through dialogue uh, but also through uh, some changes in policy. Uh, so let me review a couple of those things. Um, I actually kicked those off uh, with a speech that I gave early in my time uh, as legal advisor in 2005 at the Atlantic Council in Washington. Uh, and when some of you may remember the old book about uh, uh, are uh, men from Mars and women from Venus. Uh, and I had said, you know, at that point, just, it appears that uh, the U.S. is from Mars and U.S. and, and Europe is from Venus, it's sort of the warlike United States and the Europeans are just sort of trying to get along. But I, I said, look, we really are not as divided as people think. We've gotten divided over uh, a number of issues, and we, we need to sit down and talk about uh, these things so we understand each other better. Um, in the back of the room was the, uh, was the uh, Austrian ambassador who had just been appointed the legal advisor of Austria, some of you may know him, Ferdinand Trautensdorf, distinguished Austrian diplomat, and he came up to me afterwards and he said, you know, you're really serious about engaging in dialogue because we have a sense that the U.S. just wants to go its own way, uh, to be unilateral, to not be multilateral, not to talk to us in Europe. Uh, and so this is a welcome, if true. And I said, absolutely. Uh, I felt we have not done as good a job as we should have in the first term talking about you know, why we're doing some of the things that we're doing, at least explaining ourselves and hearing your concerns. And he said, fine. We want, want to start uh, a dialogue between the U.S. and the EU. Uh, and so starting in 2005 and all through my time as legal advisor, it actually continues now to this day, uh, it has been a formal uh, dialogue on counterterrorism issues uh, uh, between the U.S. and the European Union, at, uh, essentially at the legal advisor level, but also with defense and foreign policy experts. We either meet in uh, capitals, sometimes in Strasbourg on the side of the Cadi meeting, sometimes uh, in Washington, uh, and would meet during my time uh, two to three times per uh, presidency. Uh, and my goal uh, was to try with Europe, but the also in the multilateral setting, but also bilaterally with individual countries uh, to try to narrow differences on counterterrorism issues. Uh, and so just, th this is going to be the subject of much of my talk tomorrow with NATO, but just to briefly review sort of where we started and where we've come now, you know, in part through dialogue, but part through, of course, changes of policy. And, well, back in 2005, much discontent about the U.S. approach to uh, al-Qaeda and non-state actors. The legal view that I was receiving from Europe at the time was it is not possible for a state to be in a conflict with a non-state group. Uh, that is not a legal possibility. Uh, 
the way to approach a non-state group of terrorists like Al-Qaeda is you arrest them and you prosecute them. And we have a lot of experience in Europe doing that. You know, the Red Brigades, the Red Army Faction, the IRA, we don't understand what's the matter with you in the United States that you've got to go and invade a country and capture all these people and hold them as combatants in a war. Uh, and the, the, the concept that the U.S. is in a armed conflict with a non-state group is just something that we, uh, that we don't accept. Uh, through uh, a considerable dialogue, uh, uh, though there ended up being movement uh, from the 2005 to 2009 period, and I think growing acceptance that in fact, uh, when you are dealing with a large terrorist organization uh, like Al-Qaeda that is state-like in many ways, uh, that a, uh, the paradigm of an armed conflict and under the laws of war is an, it can in fact be appropriate. Now this is, let me be very quick to say, I am not saying that the U.S. decisions in 2001 through 2009 were all correct and proper and it was just a matter of convincing Europeans that we were right. That's not at all what I'm saying. What I'm saying is we had not explained very well why we were doing certain things, what our theories were, hearing the concerns in Europe and elsewhere, and then trying to uh, have a dialogue about these things. Um, uh, the, the Obama administration, of course, continued many of these same policies, much to the surprise of many in Europe. The idea of being in an armed conflict uh, with Al Qaeda, the right to hold uh, uh, detainees under the laws of war rather than prosecuting them, uh, and then the controversial concept uh, that one, a state can use force against non-state groups in another country if that country is either unwilling or unable to prevent the threat. So these were concepts that were controversial at the time that I was explaining them, uh, but we had very good discussions. Uh, I heard the concerns on the other side and brought them back to Washington, and I think the, the uh, explanations that I was providing were then uh, spread around. They continued through the Obama administration. Uh, and then when the ISIS conflict started in 2014 with a new non-state group, uh, again, that was not uh, 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 that, that was you know, in another country, Iraq and Syria, uh, and where U.S. Or, and foreign, or U.S. and European criminal laws did not apply, again, the same legal issues came up uh, and confronted uh, both the United States and Europe with the same issues of what is the appropriate legal paradigm to apply. Uh, I, again, these, these issues have not been fully sorted out. One of the things I'm going to say at the NATO Legal Conference tomorrow is that we, there's still a good deal of work to do on what the appropriate legal framework ought to be for a conflict between a state and a non-state group. Uh, but in fact, in the conflict with ISIS, where we have many coalition partners, it's become accepted uh, that one, uh, a state can be in a conflict with a non-state group like ISIS. Uh, that the appropriate paradigm is not just to uh, arrest people and then to bring them back. One of the problems that we're faced right now is what to do with 10,000 people in Syria, uh, uh, whether the foreign fighters will come back to uh, Europe and the United States and other places. Uh, uh, but there's become a, more of an acceptance uh, of this uh, legal paradigm of a conflict between a state uh, and a non-state. Uh, so again, we've seen over 15, 16, 17 years a good deal uh, of progress in that area, but more needs to be done. Uh, uh, that I will say on that, linking it back to the Trump administration, uh, that does not seem to be an area of conflict uh, so much between uh, the U.S. and Europe, or at least not that I'm aware of, in part because the Trump administration has really not done anything different legally uh, than what either the Bush or the Obama administrations did. I think if we suddenly see the Trump administration, as we occasionally see uh, mentioned in the paper, sending more people to Guantanamo, then this could, uh, could re-raise some of the concerns. Although, frankly, since all countries in Europe are, are struggling with what to do with the foreign fighters, uh, 
uh, in Syria uh, and where they should go if they are brought out of Syria and brought home. Uh, it, perhaps there will be not quite as much criticism there. I, I personally have uh, long been uh, 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 in favor of closing Guantanamo. I opposed it when I was in government, uh, and but it looks like it's going to be there for quite a period of time. Um, let me move on to the second issue which I dealt with, uh, uh, which I had set out in 2005 to try to resolve. This is much in the news these days, and this is the International Criminal Court. Uh, the, as you know, the Rome Statute came into force uh, in 2002. Uh, uh, John Bolton, now our National Security Advisor, was Undersecretary. Uh, he was the one who uh, famously unsigned the Rome Statute on behalf of the United States. Uh, as you know, that was not actually an unsigning, since you can't unsign a treaty. What he did was he notified the Secretary General that the United States did not intend to become party. Uh, I thought that more was made of that document than was really necessary since, frankly, the Clinton administration had already said the United States did not plan to become party because they had said that while the, the United States had voted against the Rome Statute and while President Clinton had authorized signature, he had then said that he was not going to send it to the Senate, which therefore meant that the United States was not going to become party. So the Bush administration simply formally uh, uh, ratified that, but it was a provocative move to, to send a formal letter to the UN. Um, the, uh, as you recall, the US then passed legislation, much blamed on the Bush administration, although it was really Congress that did it, was this famous American Service Members Protection Act, which required the US to uh, negotiate non-surrender agreements with different countries to require countries not to surrender officials or US uh, soldiers. Uh, to the ICC, uh, uh, or otherwise, if they didn't agree to do that, to give up all counterterrorism assistance. That was always blamed on George Bush. I'm fond of reminding uh, uh, my European friends that actually Hillary Clinton and John Kerry, when they were in the Senate, both voted for the American Service Members Protection Act, including the provision to invade the Hague. Uh, and that's because, as a politician, uh, it's very difficult to vote against something called the American Service Members Protection Act. You know, if you go home to your district and say, I voted against the American Service Members Protection Act, you've got some explaining to do. Uh, so anyway, I, that, that Invade the Hague uh, uh, Act and the Article 98 agreements were always blamed on George Bush, but it was really something that Congress inflicted on us. Nonetheless, you know, that strategy or that, that uh, 2002 to fourth period of the unsigning of the Rome Statute and these Article 98 agreements created a lot of friction uh, in Europe. Uh, I set out in the second term uh, to try to resolve that within the bounds of US policy, which was we were not going to become part of the Rome Statute, but we supported the ideals of the International Criminal Court. Obviously, uh, uh, the people who had committed genocide uh, uh, should be held accountable. Uh, so in the second term, we shifted. Uh, one of the first things we did was actually to allow the uh, uh, Darfur genocide to be referred to the International Criminal Court. The U.S. Uh, uh, abstained on that resolution, much to the surprise of many, uh, and then supported the ICC's uh, investigation of Bashir uh, in, uh, in Darfur. I then, for the whole second term, gave a number of speeches in European capitals saying, uh, look, we've become too divided over the International Criminal Court. We share its goals. You need to understand the United States is not going to become party uh, to the court because we think it's flawed. This is not a Bush administration policy. This is something that started from the Clinton administration. And so we need to basically just uh, agree to disagree uh, uh, that uh, you, you in Europe and, and other supporters of the ICC uh, uh, must not think that you are ultimately going to persuade the United States to become party because it's not going to happen anytime soon. What we can do is agree, though, that the ICC is doing uh, some useful work. It has a role uh, in international criminal justice, and the United States is prepared to support it. Uh, I think there was some initial skepticism when I was giving these speeches, uh, but by the end of 2009, I, there was a recognition that there really had been a pretty significant pivot uh, in ICC policy. Uh, that continued throughout the Obama administration. I think there had been a, maybe a hope that the Obama administration would then submit the 
the Rome Statute to the Senate. Uh, that, of course, didn't happen. Uh, and somewhat warmer approach to the ICC, but, but pretty much a, a continuation of, uh, of uh, uh, peaceful coexistence and cooperation. Uh, unfortunately, ICC now much back in the news because uh, uh, John Bolton, gave, now National Security Advisor, gave a major speech in Washington last fall. Uh, his inaugural speech as National Security Advisor, uh, and somewhat uh, remarkable given other threats to our national security from China, from Russia, from North Korea, from Iran, uh, that his maiden speech was an attack on the International Criminal Court. Uh, but John has never liked the International Criminal Court, and he's a lawyer, and so he gave, he gave a very, very strong speech saying that if the ICC continues to come after the United States in this uh, investigation of, uh, of uh, uh, U.S. activities in Afghanistan, uh, that the U.S. would prosecute the prosecutors and freeze the assets of the judges and deny them visas. Uh, uh, so a really very hostile approach. I thought this was unfortunate because what it really did was to completely undo the work that I had did from 2005 to 2009 to put a, uh, the relationship between the U.S. and the ICC and ICC parties uh, on a, uh, a path of peaceful coexistence. And to be clear, and you can probably tell this already, I didn't do that because I was a ICC lover, uh, although I do think it has a role to play, uh, but I also think that the court has flaws. What I saw, and this gets to the point I'm making overall, is there are ways to bridge these differences, uh, and we had bridged them in the second term of the Bush administration. Now, that said, uh, the Trump administration, John Bolton, are in fact reacting to a pretty significant provocation from the court. Uh, the, the prosecutor for the first time is threatening to investigate the United States and has recommended to the pretrial chamber that the U.S. be investigated. So no country in the world, and certainly the United States, is going to just ignore that. Uh, uh, the, the, any state, including the United States, is going to push back. I think John Bolton pushed back harder than was necessary. I don't think he actually could have cleared the speech that he gave, which suggested that he was going to freeze the assets of judges and prosecutors and to deny them visas and to try to criminally prosecute them, I don't think he probably cleared that with our Justice Department and our Treasury Department, because I don't understand as a legal matter how he could actually do that. Um, but again, I, this is an area that cries out for uh, the, the issues to be worked out. Uh, I'm sure we'll have a discussion about this in a minute. I'm fully aware of you know, the concerns that uh, people have about you know, U.S. military activities in Afghanistan, uh, uh, but uh, you know, whether the U.S. should really be in the sights of the ICC, uh, my argument would be that the prosecutor is going to do more long-term damage to the court by coming after the United States uh, uh, than by trying to uh, uh, really go back to the uh, peaceful coexistence that we had had where the United States was supporting the court. Um, the, so that was just another set of issues that I had tried to resolve that unfortunately have now uh, come back much in the news. Uh, last one was sort of the overall approach to uh, international law and, and international uh, uh, dispute resolution. Generally, there was a belief, I think, in Europe that the Bush administration didn't believe in international law at all. Uh, and I just want to give you a couple of facts and then bring you up to where we are in the Trump administration. Uh, one, uh, some of these statistics may surprise you, but during the, uh, during the Bush administration, we got 163 treaties approved by the Senate. Uh, that's more treaties, more new treaty law in an eight-year presidency than at any point in American history. Uh, in the Four years I was legal advisor from 2005-2009, uh, we had 110 treaties approved by the Senate. That's an absolutely mm -hmm. stunning number of treaties. Bilateral treaties, multilateral treaties, law of war treaties. Uh, Mike Meyer from the Defense Department here helped me to negotiate a number of the CCW treaties, the Red Crystal Treaty. Uh, we dusted off the old 1954 Hague Cultural Property Convention that the United States had negotiated after World War II and then it failed to ratify and we had that ratified. Uh, environmental treaties, human rights treaties, 
a, a whole variety of different treaties. The, and these were all personally transmitted by President Bush because every treaty has to be transmitted personally by the President. And then under our system, when the Senate approves it, then comes back to the President for ratification. Uh, the President ratifies the treaty with the advice and consent of the Senate. So these were all uh, sent over and then ratified by the President of the United States. So more new treaty law during that period than at any point in American history. Just by way of comparison, during the eight years of the Obama administration, only 20 treaties approved by the Senate. In the last two years uh, under the Trump administration, I think it's only been six treaties approved by the Senate. So what my point there is one, a lot of new international law uh, was uh, uh, adopted by the United States during those eight years of the Bush administration. And then two, car uh, corollary, unfortunately we are seeing a real trough in our Senate's willingness to approve treaties right now. Even, even old bilateral uh, treaties like extradition treaties and tax treaties, things that no senator ever used to have problems about, we have conservative members of our Senate opposing. Uh, uh, last one, uh, which I'll be interested to see how many of you remember, it was one of the things that I worked the hardest on as legal advisor, um, although, well, and, well actually I should say another thing, I worked on as legal advisor, which I was unsuccessful. My favorite treaty, which we didn't get through with 163, was the Law of the Sea Convention, uh, which the Bush administration supported. We had a number of sets of hearings. I personally went and testified, uh, but again, back then even we could not get the uh, Senate to uh, approve the treaty. My, uh, my children, who were then teenagers at the time, got so tired of me uh, talking about the Law of the Sea Convention that they gave me a button at Christmas because they were convinced that I could not go through any conversation in life without somehow inserting the Law of the Sea Convention. So they gave me a button that said, please ask me about my treaty. <laughs> uh, the, uh, the last uh, really goes to the heart of international law and dispute resolution, which is uh, proceedings before the International Court of Justice. Uh, the, uh, I don't know how many of you remember this, but the, uh, during the Bush administration, Mexico had sued the United States uh, over a group of Mexican nationals who had committed crimes and murders in the United States, uh, had been convicted and then sentenced to death uh, in a variety of different states, mostly Texas, California, some other places. Uh, the legal issue was that when these Mexicans had been arrested, though, they had not been notified of their Vienna Convention consular rights, uh, the right to access to a consular officer, largely uh, because the arresting officers, when they found someone who speaks Spanish in Texas, the immediate thought is not, oh, you must be from a foreign country. It is, well, you must be a Spanish-speaking Texan. Uh, but so it's true that these arresting officers had failed in their treaty responsibilities. Um, Mexico ultimately sued the United States before the International Court of Justice for a violation of the Vienna Convention. Uh, 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 the United States lost. The ICJ ordered the United States to review the convictions of all of these Mexicans. So the very first international law issue that I and Secretary Rice were confronted with in 2005 was what to do with an order of the International Court of Justice that told the President of the United States that he had to, to tell all the states to review these death sentences, including in his home state of Texas, uh, where they, there had been grisly murders committed. So this really pitted the most sensitive issues of domestic politics with uh, a obligation of the International Court of Justice. Uh, what you may not recall is that on the recommendation of Secretary Rice, President Bush then uh, issued an executive order ordering the states, including his home state of Texas, uh, uh, that they had to comply with the ruling of the International Court of Justice. I can assure you that as president, his mailbag was not filled with letters telling him, Mr. President, you've done the right thing. Uh, it was incredibly unpopular. Uh, and in fact, uh, Texas, then his own state, then sued the president. Uh, uh, it was essentially uh, Texas versus the president of the United States saying, uh, you cannot tell us in Texas what to do. Uh, for those of you who know American politics well, this case then went all the way up to the Supreme Court. Texas was represented by its then Solicitor General, a man named Ted Cruz. So it was Ted Cruz versus George Bush. 
Uh, I was on the briefs for the Bush administration defending the president's action to comply with international law, uh, a ruling of the International Court of Justice. I will tell you somewhat sensitively, we got no appreciation for what we were doing uh, in the rest of the world, and we got uh, opprobrium heaped upon us in the United States for listening to a group of 15 judges in the Hague. Nonetheless, the president tried to do the right thing. Um, sadly, our Supreme Court, somewhat surprisingly to me, uh, said that Texas was right, uh, that the president did not have the power under our Constitution to order the states what to do. Well, they conceded that he was bound under the UN Charter to uh, comply with rulings of the ICJ, but said that under our Constitution he lacked the power as president alone to just to tell the states what to do. So this gets a little bit to some of these issues of the national emergency in the wall, that the president cannot by himself just order things to be done, even if it's for the right reason. Uh, so I just a little bit of a reminder of some of the issues we dealt with in the Bush administration, um, and then winding up with the Trump administration. Um, interestingly, there, there are actually three cases against the United States before the ICJ right now. Iran has sued us twice. Uh, one over the Iran deal for pulling out of the Iran deal. Uh, uh, second, uh, for seizing some of their assets to pay a counterterrorism judgment, which they said was a violation of their sovereignty. Uh, and then the state of Palestine, even though it's not a member of the United Nations, has sued the United States and the ICJ uh, for moving the embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. So uh, the United States is currently defending three cases before the ICJ. Uh, my successor several times removed, the current legal advisor of the State Department, who's really very good, has been defending those cases. Uh, uh, I worry a little bit about what the administration may ultimately do uh, if, we, if the rulings in those cases don't go uh, the right way. Uh, the, we have already, John Bolton has already announced that we have withdrawn from the Treaty of Amity with Iran, uh, which would prevent Iran from bringing more cases against us, although candidly, uh, there's not much amity between Iran and the United States these days anyway, so probably makes sense to withdraw from the Treaty of Amity. Uh, so where does that leave us? I, I've reviewed this history a little bit just to say, oh, look, there were there were tensions between the United States and Europe during the Bush administration. Uh, we worked in the second term very hard to resolve them uh, uh, and made some progress on, in a number of areas. Uh, uh, dialogue is very important. You know, we we sometimes you know we talk a lot about dialogue uh, and sometimes make fun of it that you know, there's too much talking and not enough action, uh, but certainly. Uh, talking through these issues really will help. I personally think that the, with respect to the ICC uh, that there would be try ways to try to resolve those issues uh, through more uh, dialogue. Uh, and then in some of these other areas, I think sitting down, try to understand, uh, for the Trump administration to understand concerns of its allies, but also for its allies to understand uh, some of the concerns of officials in the Trump administration. You know, President Trump, despite his inexperience in government, uh, is representing in particular a block of Americans who feel that they uh, have not benefited from globalization, uh, that life has passed them by, that the United States has gotten a bad deal. Uh, uh, and as all of you know, there are blocks of voters in all of our countries. You know, this is what's going on with Brexit. Uh, this is what's going on in Austria. This is what's going on uh, in countries uh, you know, all across Europe. Uh, and so, you know, President Trump, despite uh, you know the actions that he's been taking that I personally disagree with, oh, is responding to a a nugget of concern amongst a group of Americans, and we need uh, even internationally to try to address some of those uh, uh, concerns. Uh, I'll just end by mentioning an initiative that I've been working on. I don't know whether you saw it, but the. Uh, at the Atlantic Council, along with a, uh, a Canadian think tank, uh, just announced at the Munich Security Conference last week uh, a Declaration of Democratic Principles, which essentially is sort of a revived Atlantic Charter, uh, with recognizing this point that in all of our countries there's perhaps a lack of appreciation for 
uh, democratic principles, commitment to the rule of law, uh, to a free press, uh, uh, to human rights, uh, uh, and that these principles that you know, young people are really sort of taking for granted these days and are being trammeled uh, in all of our countries and that we need to have a reaffirmation uh, of these important democratic principles and have politicians instead of attacking our institutions as we see President Trump doing and as we see politicians in other areas doing uh, have more of our politicians really try to emphasize the importance uh, uh, of some of these key democratic principles. So uh, I encourage you to take a look at it. It's on the uh, website of the uh, Atlantic Council. Uh, was co-chaired by, uh, uh, actually led by a number of foreign ministers and prime ministers uh, all across the world. Uh, Steve Hadley, former national security advisor, and Adeline Albright were two of the co-chairs, but it had Japanese and European co-chairs. I think Carl Bolt was one of the co-chairs. And there's an effort to not just have this declaration of principles set out, uh, but to then try to really get it reaffirmed in all of our countries. So uh, why don't I stop there? I know I've touched on a whole lot of different issues, both reviewing history and also talking about where we are in the Trump administration. Uh, and I am happy to take your questions. <laughs>